Uh, so let's begin our session today. Integrated planning is a critical function of municipal government. For many reasons, municipal planning capacity has not developed in Newfoundland and Labrador as it has in other jurisdictions. In addition to the operational implications of this planning capacity gap, this session will address the broader idea that the municipal sector has not developed a planning culture and generally does not value planning. While the consequences of poor planning are readily apparent, without a strong planning culture, culture councils are often frustrated as to how to respond or why anyone even believes it is their role to plan. Craig Powett, complete our speaker today, completed his Master's of Development Economics uh, from the Dalhousie University in 1996. He worked in economic development policy with the provincial government for five years before becoming the executive director of municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador in 2001. His role has afforded him a unique perspective on the municipal sector, its institutions, its systems, and its thousands of volunteers and staff. He has developed several successful support programs for municipalities, most with an emphasis on planning capacity. Craig has served on the board of directors for the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation and the provincial branch of the Institute of Public Administration of Canada. He is currently president of the Municipal Training and Development Corporation. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Craig Powell. Thank you very much. Um, as as uh, you were reading the introduction, uh, I, I was thinking, you know, I wrote that two, three weeks ago and promptly forgot about it. So I'm, I'm pretty well delighted that it pretty much meshes with what I'm actually going to talk about today. A um, couple things I want to mention about the title. Now, Whose Fault Is That? Uh, is a book written by a gentleman named Cato Waddell, who taught here, I believe, in anthropology or sociology. Uh, that, and I took a course many, many, many moons ago with a gentleman named uh, Rex Clark in anthropology. And it's a book about a community, uh, an unnamed community, specifically about a man named George, whose name is not really George, uh, who ends up getting injured. He's a fisherman. He fishes in the summer. He works in the forest in the winter, ends up getting injured, and can't fish or work in the woods anymore, and spends the next 15, 20 years of his life uh, frustrated about that fact, obviously, but interacts with the, his community in a very interesting way in that he starts doing things like getting up at 4 a.m. and lighting the fire in his stove so his neighbors can see smoke coming out when they go fishing so they understand he's not lazy, he hasn't given up. Um, and then when he turns 65 and starts getting uh, Canada pension, all of that stops because now he doesn't have to prove that he's not lazy anymore, he's retired. And he can relax and not have to worry about that sort of thing anymore. And I find an awful lot of parallels between the character of George, or the, who was the person in the book, and municipal councils and councillors across this province, especially in rural communities. And I've also subtitled it Local Governance and the Search for a Planning Culture in Newfoundland and Labrador. And I want you to know that as far as I'm concerned, the search is just starting. Uh, this is not a history lesson on where how we've gotten to this point or the search that we've done. I'm saying we haven't even started looking yet. Uh, and I really think it's a critical thing for us to start doing. I also want to point out that I'm not a planner. I'm not going to overwhelm you with technical details. I am literally, as uh, Moyen said, coming at this from my own perspective as a person who runs a nonprofit organization that represents municipal government very interested in municipal policy and operations. But I'm looking at it from the outside. And what I really hope today is that I'm going to raise some things innocently <laughs> that resonate with some of you. And we'll have a good discussion about it. We'll have a good chat about it. Because I think we need to start asking some questions about this in our province that we haven't asked yet. So I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction, uh, some background. I'm going to talk about some of the symptoms of this issue that I see in municipal government and the municipal system and in municipal councillors themselves. Talk a little bit about culture change that I think is necessary and then I hope we'll have a good discussion. Uh, like I said, I, I don't have the answers. I have suggestions. I'm not even sure I'm asking the right questions to be honest. So I'm really hoping that we'll have some time at the end to have a good chat about it and see, see where we can go because really when it comes down to it, uh, we're talking about local democracy. We're talking about something that's essential 
to the way we live our lives in Western civilization. Uh, we send many good young people to far distant lands to give their lives so that we can do this, we can live like this. And I'm not sure in this province that we spend enough time thinking about the implications of it at the local level and how we can act as citizens, how we can contribute as citizens. So I take it fairly seriously. My bias is up front. I believe firmly that municipal governments exist to plan. If, we, if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't need municipal governments. We would need companies who plow roads and, and collect dogs and that sort of thing. We wouldn't need municipal government. The reason you have a municipal government, a representative system of government, is so that it can represent the people's views on a plan for how we move forward. I'm also going to take a bit of a rural focus. Most of the issues I'm going to talk about affect rural communities in this province. Uh, but I firmly believe, and, and a lot of the research we've done, in fact, in conjunction with the Hare Center, shows that we don't live in communities in this province. We live in regions. We have little spots delineated by municipal boundaries called municipalities. But where we live, where we shop, where we work, where we get health care, where we learn, where we go to school, are in regions. And if you don't think the quality of life or the decisions being made in rural communities affect those who live in urban communities, just think about where you get your water. Think about the boundaries of some of these urban places where rural decisions are being made that have vast implications for urban dwellers. We are absolutely and utterly interconnected in what we've called through the research uh, functional regions. So if you were to talk to somebody in municipal government, if I was giving an MNL presentation, a Municipalities New Plan Labrador presentation right now, and somebody said, what are the challenges facing municipal government? These are the kinds of things I would talk about. Drinking water. At any given time, for a variety of reasons, we have about 170 to 200 boil water advisories happening in the province. That's around 57,000 people who can't drink their tap water in our province. Wastewater, treating wastewater. We don't treat our wastewater for the most part. We're getting there in some of the urban centers, but the vast majority of sewer runs freely through municipal pipes out into the ocean. Federal government is bringing down new regulations, which I applaud, that say we have to treat that wastewater. It's going to cost $400 million to build the facilities to treat the wastewater. And we have to build them in the next 10 years. We only spend, I'll get to this in a minute, we only spend 70 to $80 million a year collectively, municipal, provincial, federal, on municipal infrastructure every year. So we're talking about doubling our municipal infrastructure spending for the next 10 years. Electoral apathy. In 2009, we had our last set of municipal elections. 50% of the councils did not need a contested election. Not enough people ran to require an election. So if your council has five seats, maybe five people ran, more likely four people. And we have extremely low voter turnout at the local level, 20% in some cases. We have rapidly aging infrastructure. And then I use this phrase in two ways. A lot of our infrastructure is old. We have local roads going back to the 70s. We have municipal infrastructure that's fairly new, but is not being well maintained because the municipalities don't have the money or the expertise to do proper maintenance. So in fact, it ages more quickly than it should. So pipes in the ground, facilities that are supposed to last 30 years are only lasting 10, 20 years. That's more expensive. We have an extremely ineffective fiscal system, the way municipalities make their money. 70-odd percent of municipal revenue, own source revenue, comes from property tax. Property tax is widely held to be one of the worst tax systems ever devised by man. Uh, it is highly regressive. So it has absolutely nothing to do. It doesn't track your ability to pay. It doesn't really track your use of services. Uh, it's supposed to track income, but it does so 
in a very jumpy way because a municipality gets uh, uh, an assessment done of the value of all their property within their community every three years. So you have these big jumps in what they can base the property tax on. And in fact, even those assessments lag behind the economy. So as the economy of a city like St. John's takes off or any place, the, the revenue uh, base for that, the tax base for that, adjusts very, very slowly. And they have completely and utterly insufficient human resources. And by this, I don't mean the people working in municipalities aren't up to the job, although in some cases that's absolutely true because they started back in 1975 when you didn't need more than high school to run a town office. And now you have very complex environmental and financial regulatory issues to deal with, and you don't have the background to do it. What I really mean is that as a whole, the system doesn't have the staff to do the job. 74% of municipalities in the province have one staff person or fewer which means a good chunk of them have essentially a part-time clerk who comes in three days a week or every Wednesday, opens the letters, does the correspondence, pays the bills, and prepares for the council meeting. And not much else happens in between. But if I'm talking from my perspective as an individual and what I've seen in the sector, there's only one challenge, and that's planning. Planning, the discipline of planning, the activity of planning is absolutely fundamental to good governance. We cannot make good decisions about how we're spending millions of dollars every year without a good planning system. And while we have good planners in places, and while some towns have good plans, we don't have a good planning system. And I would argue most of the people involved in the municipal, municipal sector don't care that we don't have a good planning system. Not because they're ignorant of it, simply because, or not because they're uh, trying to do a bad job, simply because they don't understand the value planning can bring to the decision making that they have to do. So some numbers, gotta have numbers. $450 million, roughly, what municipal governments spend, <coughs> operational spending, clearing the streets, employing people, all that kind of stuff, every year, collectively. <clears throat> $80 million, roughly, what is spent on infrastructure in the province every year. Is that about right? I got it from, uh, from Clooney, so yeah. <laughs> it must be right. And that's on infrastructure. Maintaining the infrastructure comes out of the $450 million. 276 municipalities in this province. There's 510,000 people here roughly. We have 276 municipalities. Actually, we have 271, and then there's five more that are in our community governments. 75% of those municipalities, of that 276, have a population under 1,000. 50%, over 50% actually, have a population under 500. So of that 276, how many have active town, oh, how many have town plans? I won't say active yet. 110. Way less than half actually have a municipal plan. I would say a sizable chunk of those are probably over a decade old. So you have to question whether they're even relevant anymore given the pace of change, either increasing pace of change or decreasing. And the people doing the work actual employees of municipalities who do planning, about 10 for 276 municipalities. Now there are a few very busy, very good planning consultants in the province who sort of backfill that. But in terms of people who work day to day in a council office, there's about 10, and there's a good chunk of them work at the city of St. John's, Mount Pearl, Corner Book. So that's the foundation from which we're having this discussion. And as you can imagine, there's a certain series of symptoms that come from that. And I've categorized them into two. First is systemic. This is the obvious stuff. If you're looking at the whole system, the system is very fragmented, our municipal system. Geographically, it's fragmented. Uh, we have maintained for a very long period of time 
a large number of units, municipal units, uh, even though most of those units, most of those municipalities are operating in what I mentioned earlier is a regional footprint. So environmental impact, economic development impact, land use impact is almost always regional. But we keep working in this local paradigm as if the rest of the world is not happening around us. And we're very fragmented in terms of governance. There are 276 municipal governments in the province. There are 633 places where people live in this province. So there's another 180 odd local service districts where they don't really have a, a tax system. They don't have the authority of municipal governments. Uh, they can levy specific fees for specific services. Uh, it's not really what I would call democracy. And we have unincorporated areas, places where people just live. There's no planning. There's no government. There's no nothing, which sounds like heaven for some people. But I would argue it's a very dangerous situation. Outside of Prince Edward Island, we're the only province that has that kind of significant land mass outside any kind of municipal governance or local democratic institutions. And we also have very weak in, uh, integration. And what I mean by that is that we continue to have, and this is not just us, you can see this all over the place, we continue to have very strong silos of planning. So, and activities, and decision making, in fact. So, environmental plans are done by environmental people talking to other environmental people. Development plans are done by people involved in development for the purposes of development. Infrastructure planning is done around how best to use the infrastructure by engineers and infrastructure people. Very little of what we do touches one another, even though, quite obviously, what you're going to do with infrastructure or development is going to impact the environment. Decisions you make around environmental stewardship are going to affect how you design your infrastructure and what kind of development you allow to create. But in most parts of this province, those things don't touch one another. They don't talk to one another because we haven't had that strong culture of planning embedded into our local system of government. But more, more concerning for me, and going back to the title, now whose fault is that, is the impact it has on the people involved, councils and councillors, the people who make decisions at local levels about where you can do things, where your recreation is going, how you're getting your drinking water, that sort of thing. And this is where the more sort of insidious impact is. And this is where my, most of my concern is. Councils and councillors, because they've never really been involved in land use planning or planning in general, exhibit a lack of experience. I mean, they don't have that kind of experience like councillors would, even if you come to a council fresh in Nova Scotia, for example, and you've never seen planning before in your life, don't know what it is. Once you show up on council, there's an entire system that you need to lock into and you need to learn. Here, that doesn't exist. So you get on council, except for the Urban Rural Planning Act. There's no ready-made system. And you don't have to read the Urban Rural Planning Act if you don't want to, and I would suggest most councillors <laughs> probably haven't. Um, that lack of experience then leads to and, and exacerbates a lack of capacity. We don't have people running for council who have done postgraduate work in land use planning. They've never experienced it before, and when they get on council, what they find is that their council doesn't have the capacity to do planning either. So it's not like they can rely on the council's planner or the municipality's planner to help them get a grasp of this and understand how the decisions they're making affect people's lives. They're just swinging in the breeze. That leads to some very severe frustration. And I'll show you a little chart in a second that I sort of think outlines how this happens. Counselors find themselves unable to respond to people's complaints. Things happen in the community. Stuff gets put somewhere that somebody else doesn't think is the right place. And the council hears about it. But the council didn't know that those people didn't want that thing there. They didn't want that house there. They didn't want that mink farm there. And even if they did know, 
They don't really have a framework with which to decide whether we should put it there or not. An application comes in to build something, council thinks about it within their little room, they do the best they can with the information they have, and they make a decision. And then there are ramifications. So they're frustrated because they don't understand why people are upset, and they're frustrated because they don't have the tools to do anything about it, even if they knew the people were upset to begin with. And that has been leading to, from what I've seen, and what really sort of spurred my interest in this topic and my talk today, in ambivalence about planning in general. If you go to, I, I see a lot of municipal councillors every year. I have lots of conversations about this sort of thing. Sometimes I don't even know this is what I'm talking about, but I'm trying to get information out of them. Planning in the municipal world is equated with inaction. And councillors were not elected to do nothing. They think they were elected to do something. And creating a plan and taking the time to create a plan is not doing something. That's just spinning your wheels because you don't really know what to do. You should have known when you got there. That's what they think. They think that they should arrive at the council office already knowing what's right and what needs to be done. If I didn't have the solution, I wouldn't have got elected. And they are absolutely and utterly wrong. Some examples that I can pull off immediately. Federal government has transferred uh, $82 million a year, I think, it, no, $30 million a year uh, to municipalities in this province from what they call the gas tax fund. It's for infrastructure, green infrastructure. One of the requirements of that money is to create an integrated community sustainability plan, ICSP, all of which happened. Almost all the municipalities in the province have an ICSP now. So we did a set of workshops. We just finished them. Report's not done yet. But I can tell you that 90% of the people we talked to about their ICSP haven't looked at it since the day it arrived. It's not integrated into their daily operations. If they're new, they might not have even read it yet because they haven't bothered to pull it down off the shelf. It was done, for the most part, as a way to tick a box so that federal money would flow, which is unfortunate because in our situation, the ICSPs could have been as bureaucratic and gobbledygooky as that sounds. They could have been a savior for us, and they, they may still well be. But you have every single town in the province has to have a plan, has this plan. It's not a land use plan. It's a different kind of thing, but it's a plan. But the majority of them have just put it on the shelf. We just heard that the federal government is cutting funding to regional economic development boards, which are essentially a planning institution. In the, the all over the province, there's 19 of them, 20 regions, 19 boards. Their main purpose is to plan regional economic development, to engage organizations like municipalities. Where has been the outcry from the municipal sector that these ent planning entities are gone? It's not there. You have some small spots, some isolated spots, where really good uh, relationships develop, but outside of that, you're not hearing anything. Our organization is quite upset, but the sector is not that upset. And that concerns me because, it's a, to me, it's again more evidence that the people involved in the sector don't understand the value of planning, what they could have done with these organizations should they have tried. And I think that explains to some degree why the answer to all of this is not simply to hire planners. If every municipality in the province got a couple hundred grand and we're told to go and buy, hire a planner, you don't get paid a hundred, couple hundred grand though, do you? There's travel and office and stuff. But Anne Marie is in the background going, 200 grand! Excellent! Craig Pollock says we should get 200 grand. If we hired them all, it wouldn't change a thing because the people hiring them don't understand what the planner is for. And what can be done. So here's, here's sort of a decision tree thing that's highly non-scientific, but it, to me it sort of captures the process that happens in lots of parts of our province. So we've got some kind of decision to make about whether you're going to plan or you're not going to plan. So let's say the council says, yeah, let's do a plan. Plan works out, everything's good, so you repeat it. Problem is when you repeat it, 
You go back to here, you come down to plan. Well, it might work out good this time, might work out bad. If it works out bad, presidents don't like the plan, developers get upset with you because of the plan. Well, typically you blame the plan and then you abandon planning. You don't go back and try to figure out whether the residents were wrong or whether the plan was wrong and you can readjust it. You just bail on it. And then what if you don't plan? And that, of course, creates frustration, which typically leads to this side of the tree over here. Council decides, no, nah, we are not. We don't need a plan. We're smart people. They're going to ask us questions about where to put things. We can figure this out. Works out well. That's excellent. Reinforces the idea that planning is unnecessary. So now you have more counselors thinking, we don't need plans. And of course, they repeat that mistake. If it turns out badly, then you've got that frustration I talked about at the beginning. We don't know what's going on here. Why, why is everybody upset with us? Why don't we have any money left? Why is the provincial government upset with us? There's really no happy result <laughs> out of this chart, right? I mean, and obviously this doesn't apply to everybody, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But I've seen these over and over and over and over again as I travel around the province. And that's why I really think what we're talking about here is not a technical problem. It's not a resource problem, although resources would, are needed. There needs to be a cultural change within the sector. And I would say probably just within the population. Can I swear? Okay. People need to give a shit about this. Because right now, I don't think they do. The challenge is not with one weakness or one link in the chain. It's a cultural phenomenon that must be addressed at all levels, which changes the response entirely. What's the potential? We have economic development decisions that need to be made around resource extraction and resource use, where to put our scarce resources to try to encourage job creation and the development of strong, sustainable communities. We have infrastructure decisions to make. We have a very limited amount of money to spend on infrastructure, 80 million a year. The provincial government probably gets several hundreds of millions of dollars of requests for infrastructure spending every year. Can't possibly deal with all of it. We need ways to make decisions. Tourism. Tourism is, is becoming a serious economic pillar in a lot of parts of our province. And yet you will find people building outfalls where there used to be a beach, or building, you know, allowing a, uh, a mechanic to build a garage on what used to be a nice sight line from a bread and breakfast or something like that. We have environmental issues that I don't think we, we have, can even conceive of right now, given the amount of infrastructure that's buried in the ground that we don't know about, and the challenges we have with dealing with our waste and dealing with changes in the environment. We haven't quite wrapped our heads around that yet, that we still have people living where really they shouldn't be living because we know it's going to flood there. We know it. How do we deal with that? And wellness, which is one that doesn't come up often enough, but if you're trying to have a healthy population, the back end of health care is not where you're getting the best bang for your buck. It's preventative, it's wellness, it's things you do in the community to allow people to get out and walk and participate in activities with one another. If you're not including that in your planning, then you're missing out and you're essentially, you're pushing costs off down the road when they're gonna be much, much bigger. The biggest potential I see and the biggest reason to try to push cultural change around planning is integrating all of these. There's no reason why there should be economic development plans, infrastructure plans, tourism plans. There should be plans. So what can we do? Well, we can teach. We can teach counselors. We can teach municipal staff about the value of planning. Hopefully they'll listen. That's a longer term thing. And I have to say that my organization really isn't doing a very good job of that right now. That's something we're trying to, to address. But I think we're letting the sector down on that side of things. But that's only half of teaching. We need a planning school. If planning is so important, <clears throat> so fundamental to how our municipal system, our local democratic system, works or doesn't work, why don't we invest 
in something here at this university or at the college that tries to improve that situation? Why don't we talk to the planning school in Halifax about what we can do in terms of, and I know some stuff's been done, but just buying a couple seats at that school is not really going to solve the problem. We need to invest in making this a much bigger part of our education system. We need to learn. All of us need to learn. MNL needs to learn. Provincial government needs to learn. Municipalities certainly do about what happens in other jurisdictions. And we need to learn from ourselves. There's many small jurisdictions that do planning very, very well. I think there's a lot that we can learn from them. But I think there's all kinds of things happening within our province that we can learn from as well. City of St. John's, I think, what they've done the last couple of years in terms of ramping up their engagement and that sort of thing is to be applauded. I think that's a really good step. There's things we can learn for other municipalities on that level. I think we need to invest. There's always, every presentation about local government has the request for money. So this is the request for money. We need to invest in this system. Municipalities need to invest. All orders of government need to invest. We need staff. We need better communications between municipalities. There's no municipal government network or anything like that that allows municipalities to quickly share information. We need better maps. There's all kinds of technical things we need to invest in if this is going to happen. And we need to integrate. No more silos. And I know people involved in the planning field would say, well, we're sort of moving in that direction. Yes, we are slowly moving in that direction. But when it comes to municipal government and fixing this problem, we have a deadline called the human lifespan. Because I'm willing to say that in the next set of municipal elections, 2013, next September, we are going to see significant drop off in the number of people willing to offer themselves for municipal election because they're getting old. There's m many, many councils with an average age in the 60s. These people have given enough of their time. At, at our annual convention, the provincial government gives long service awards. Uh, they had to add a 35-year award a couple of years ago because so many people have been around for 35 years that they deemed it necessary to go from 25 to 30 to 35. Those people are not coming back. The last time we had an election, they were in their mid-60s. Yeah, I got some time. I can see myself giving more to the town. The next time we have an election, they're going to be in their early 70s. Sorry, they're not coming back. So we need to get something done before essentially a good chunk of our councillors die. We need the provincial government to integrate its systems with municipal systems. Hell, we need the provincial government to integrate systems from each department with each other. Then they can integrate with the municipal system. But most importantly, we need to get rid of this idea that you can do an environmental plan for a region or an economic development plan for a region without integrating issues from the other. It's impossible. It just doesn't work. We know that. We're just having a hard time getting it done. And lastly, it sounds sort of hokey, but we need to believe. We need to believe that this is important, that it matters, that people living in healthy, sustainable, viable communities is a worthwhile cause. If we're willing to step back and sort of uh, let them die off, it will be an ugly, undignified thing to see. At the very least, we can put a planning system in place that manages decline as well as growth so that people can live a happy, healthy life. We need to walk the walk. So if planning is important and municipal plans are important, then Municipal Affairs, for example, needs to make sure that if you're getting money from the public purse, you've got a plan in place. There needs to be feedback mechanism there that tells people in the sector, we believe this is important. MNL needs to say, we believe it's important. Residents need to say that it's important. The days that you can sit back as a resident of a community, especially a rural community, 
and simply say council will take care of this are over. The issues are too complicated. Uh, they're too multi-layered. You need to have some kind of say. And right now, I'm not sure you have a mechanism to do that properly. So you need to believe that it's worthwhile and that your input will make some difference. And I think if we handle it properly, your input will absolutely make a difference. It'll make a huge difference. That's all I had to say. And I'm really interested, to be honest, in what you have to say, what you think. Thank you very much, and I hope we have a little bit of a discussion now.